Hello, and welcome back. I uh, decided to split this episode into two parts, so welcome to episode 12, part 2. Um, where I left off, I was just getting into the actual examples of um, some of these musicians on the timeline and the woman's perspective. Um, you know, the first part, you can kind of see if you got were interested in, in kind of following along to these actual examples. Uh, by ending the episode at part one, I gave people a little bit of an out if, you know, they got enough. Uh, but I was just, you know, talking about these, uh, starting off with some of these early musicians. And one of the major themes or first themes that you'll see on the timeline is just really the concept of identity. And, you know, just looking at some of these early artists and kind of, you know, the sacrifice where they sacrificing the limited amount of control they had. Um, and sacri sacrificing identity for the possibility of an identity, you know, at least having a shape, being able to shape or form one's own identity in the future, which I think is always an interesting comment, uh, concept, because, um, you know, people will often be labeled as sellouts, this and that, you know, and who often are trying to, you know, kind of forge um, a path forward. And, you know, of course, there's different ways about going, different ways to go about it. And I think... You know, I think it's an interesting view when you look at W.C. Handy and Mommy Smith, because I think in a lot of ways, you know, when you think about what they were specifically going after, which was really trying to push the music envelope further, specifically getting away from kind of a classical, you know, some of these smaller form bands, um, you know, at, at the time there wasn't a whole lot of room for a small band, but getting a shifting away from like a classical or symph symphonic or kind of that format and getting into some of these newer genres, which at the time, you know, like ragtime, um, you know, they both were credited with having in different ways, uh, first blues songs or albums or hits. Um, even though their songs were really more ragtime, but, getting it moving in that direction and kind of putting a spotlight or shedding some light on this new sort of rural genre that was called the blues. Um, you know, without that, you know, you can say, you know, if they wanted to seek independence uh, as far as money, um, opportunity, you know, they could have gone a different route. Um, but, you know, I think when you go back to earlier times and trying to, sh you know, really carve out some of these specific uh, professions or options, you almost have to, you know, you have a limit of options. You know, I think we could certainly get into a debate or a discussion about how differently could go about it. But in this case, you know, these early artists, um, most of them had to go through minstrel shows or some kind of variety or road show where there's going to be blackface, there's going to be, you know, just negative black caricatures and stereotypes, which, you know, is hugely prevalent, of course, at that, during those times. And, you know, it can't feel great for your identity at all. It can't feel good for many, many reasons. Um, but there's also, of course, this other idea of, you know, how did people view all that at the time? If you look at minstrel shows in general, you know, minstrel shows go... We talk about it in the episode, but they go very deep into American history. So obviously, one can assume or think that for a lot of people, you know, they weren't being viewed as negative, as negative as they probably should have been or could have been. And they went on for a long time, you know, of course, specifically in different, you know, not necessarily on a mainstream level, but. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it probably went on too long, I would think. But, but anyway, so, you know, that perception, what was their perception? How was it impacting them? Were they thinking about, you know, that this was how they were going to get or fulfill their dream or progress? You know, were that was it all about that foresight? And was it limited, uh, negative? You know, when you look up, look at recent history or just the entire scope of how black people were, being treated as just as far as you know clear open violence and persecution and uh just all of that you know in contrast you know how how did this fit into that you know how was how was that perceived for them and by others you know so i think 
you know that sort of identity aspect and you know kind of relating that back to the womanist perspective is just um you know whatever time period you're thinking about and how someone kind of views themselves and their identity within the community in this case how are they adapting and you know how are they kind of preser persevering and thriving you know it can you thrive while sort of taking on this sort of identity and approach um when you're you know involved in like these menstrual shows which are you know seemingly very negative towards black people yourself and the community uh, but you're sort of at the same time you're doing something that people haven't been able to do um, before um, and you know you're, you can see yourself progressing hopefully you know obviously when you're in that s situation you don't know if you're ever going to be able to have the freedom or independence to create your own art but you know you're hopefully progressing towards something that you wouldn't have not otherwise been able to progress for progress towards and other people have not been able to progress uh, towards so you know that's it's an interesting um, example and viewpoint I think and something to consider um, especially within the sort of uh, concerning these different perspectives um, of music and womanism um, and of course another th another theme that we touch on quite a bit is just the copying of music without credit or really concern. Um, this happened to Mommy Smith um, a number of times. And, you know, once again, you know, as you continue the Mommy Smith story, uh, I talked about it a little bit on another assignment, but, you know, just you already had this sort of identity impact. You've made it this far. You've thrived. You've, you know, for, you've been able to utilize your strengths and experiences to get you to this point and now you know you you make a hit you get you know you're able to make your own music your own art to a certain extent and then you know someone else uh, just basically pulls you know the, that copies that outright and is able to do that pretty willy-nilly and uh you know make more money it's a bigger hit for them um we're not cre giving credit to the culture you know they're just you know, sort of utilizing this new sound and appeal to really pros uh, prosper um, and, you know, be very, become very successful. And these artists were able to do that, to steal music from, you know, multiple different artists and take all of those, you know, kind of skim. It's kind of like, uh, I know the new Space Jam just came out, but when you think about the old Space Jam or, uh, you know, just other examples where people are able to kind of skim all the attributes that they want, all the, every, you know, every, uh, you know, top ability or skill that you want and take it for yourself, you know, and be able to produce that as your own. You're going to have all these different um, skills. Well, seemingly, you're going to have all these different skills and um, abilities that you don't have and ideas, concepts, and, you know, just incredible artistic straight um, strengths that you don't and you're just using this to become successful and prosperous and I think you know people like to to um, think and I think to some degree there might be a some grain of truth as far as you know artist to artist there's an appreciation you know like this artist who's taking it is appreciating it and is like wow you know recognizing the the skill but, you know, nonetheless, you know, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because it was stolen. And, you know, this happens throughout the timeline. But, you know, just as, I think especially just going back to Mommy Smith, um, doing what she was doing and being innovative um, in a number, number of ways. And really, um, you know, she created the first blues hit, um, among other things. And, you know, you know, that was an excess success and she experienced success due to that but I think it also has to be disheartening just to see you know the the way that artists were able to kind of just uh, white artists were able to just uh, take and scoop this music kind of from you and make it more profitable and of course some of it was when we go back to something I talked about briefly in part one 
It's just the limitations, those more firm limitations at those times um, and, and barriers at those times um, that at the time appeared to me Im immovable uh, because another aspect was that the white performers were seen more acceptable to be to perform some of the gestures and you know gestures that were and dances that were seen as provocative even those those gestures were coming from the black community a lot of times in vaudeville and these other performances uh the black artists and black dancers would help chore choreograph and you know create these dan dance moves and then the uh, white artists would take um, those moves and perform them themselves. And not only that, you know, they were the only ones who were seen culturally acceptable to perform them, even though, you know, overall they were seen as, you know, sort of crude and uh, inappropriate in general, but that was allowed and definitely was not allowed for the black performers and artists. So, you know, you have people stealing from you and then you also have, uh, you know, these firm um, regulations or rules that you can't break, you know, without severe consequence. Um, and, you know, this is not a new theme um, outside of music, but, you know, just thinking within the this sort of black music uh, realm, um, you know, that's uh, definitely a very uh, devastating and unfortunate uh, occurrence that happened and reoccurred throughout the timeline um, in different ways and obviously as time moves forward you're able to the artists are able to uh, have more flexibility as far as performance but you're still being um, labeled as obscene um, you know your dance moves are just inappropriate lyrics as it, as you know we continue to see today um, being labeled as inappropriate you know it, it with every genre and I think it's something that people can relate to today is with every genre when you talk about r&b rock you know funk is kind of an exception um and i i don't know if we'll talk about that in this episode but um and then hip-hop you know you just see the kind of this recurring theme where everyone's like oh the lyrics you know the dance moves this that, and that you know um you know it's inappropriate it's whatever you know it's not it doesn't fit the, uh, it's kind of it's kind of cultural. It doesn't fit the narrative of the mainstream, and I think you know, depending what you're talking about, I think it might be either young people's movement or it might be a cultural movement, a black cultural movement. You know, depending on what you're talking about, because you'll see friction within the culture and outside the culture. And that's you know, going back to a woman's perspective. That's you know, one of the, I think the important themes where you're be able to you're be able to you're able to recognize you know these different frictions within and outside and be able to kind of identify the differences and nuances within that to to address it um i'm just continuing to go down the line um you know we just as we move forward as i talked about in part one you know you see because we have more information more data we're able to see more complexities within each experience of each musician you know where we see we'll see some racial and social progress uh, in one area but through that you know you kind of see more nuanced examples of you know trauma these roots of trauma and history and experience of each of these these musicians and i know i think my favorite example probably is little richard just because you know from what we know um you know he, he just passed away not too long ago um you know, we know throughout his career there's uh, an enormous amount of complexity when you just talk about race and gender. Uh, you know, his upbringing, you know, not being not being able to be raised by his parents due to his sexuality. And then sort of this, you know, when you think about race and sexuality and gender in the modern era, you know, this is something that Little Richard was very uh, experiencing very acutely, you know, in the 1940s, 1950s. And so, you know, it's you can imagine the differences that were going on and he would, you know, he mostly uh, got his music start in uh, this in um, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans, um, you know, he frequented the New Orleans gay clubs and nightclub scene. And so, you know, he just was cultured much more different than the eventual mainstream culture that he was really exposed to and uh, really, um, you know, rose to the top of. And you, you kind of, you know, as we learned about, 
him over time you could you knew that uh, there was a lot of internal struggle struggles and identity issues that were going on with him just because you know there's a, a huge cultural contrast in some of these different arenas that he was trying to have to navigate and I think it's a you know it's you know a very interesting example and sh- really shows the kind of that complexity that you know some of the other theories uh, when you talk about um, social work uh, humanism um, public health you know there's limitations in some of these theories and being able to being able to approach someone um, culturally but looking deeper into individual experiences and experiences of trauma and all that and how it all kind of comes together um, and of course other examples uh, on the timeline uh, Robert Johnson is a great one uh, just because of the he was shrouded in um, a lot of uh, in fairy tales and uh, you know lore as far as dealing with the devil and as I talk about in the Robert Johnson episode you know, just you know th- that was only one um, way to look at the situation you can also look at his situation from more of a cultural context and you know referring that he's often referring to some of the struggles of black people um, the black community and some of the adversity that they were facing from the white community um, like in Crossroads where he's standing at the crossroads uh, at night in uh, Mississippi during Jim Crow era you know when he refers to the devil it might just be more about fear of you know what might happen to him at these crossroads so there's a lot of different possibilities and of course when you look in the history of robert johnson he had pretty d- deep trauma um from early on another great example is jackal cooper and just kind of his experiences as far as identity and what he was trying to do because jackal cooper you know was one of the first uh was the first um radio programmer and uh, director and you know when he was able to take over the radio you know, he, because of his experiences, he had to go through white radio and portray all these black caricatures. And because of that, and, you know, what he was, his goal was to really raise up the black community, and specifically during the time of my, the Great Migration in Chicago, where he was based, uh, you know, he was really focused on the black middle class. And so he really was trying to push that narrative and, uh, and raise up the the middle class specifically and because of that he really only played jazz and gospel he didn't really play blues and he didn't really uh or something these other genres because you know he wanted to make sure that to prove to like white america mainstream america that you know black people could be culture they could be this and that um you know be middle class citizens and upper class citizens and of course, some of these other, you know, the blues and these other rural based genres um, were a little bit more crude in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of times they were seen as anti-Christian and, you know, that's not the narrative that he wanted to push or that's not the um, view or um, cultural uh, perspective that he wanted to push. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, it was kind of. It, it didn't help a lot of the uh, rural black community that was moving into the into urban areas. Um, you know, I don't think it was necessarily welcoming. They didn't, you know, he specifically made sure to, you know, not use like a vernacular or, you, you know, he wanted to really uh, stay proper and all of that. And so, you know, it didn't necessarily speak to the people or welcome the people who were coming into the city and it didn't necessarily reflect, fully reflect the culture um, because as we said with the blue the blue lineage the the blues musician the blues was kind of the music that was pushing forward modern music in a lot of ways and it was really telling the story that had been untold you know it was really giving a narrative a perspective you know some of the challenges that the black community was facing um that w- really had gone untold and um you know once again you know i think jack l cooper is really important when you think about black radios I spoke on in, in part one, but you know, there's, you know, this sort of conflict and identity, identity, you can't really blame him for taking the approach that he did because of the experiences that he had and 
you know, what he was doing. You know, he was known as a great community man, you know, all of that. So it was all important. It was all good. But, you know, I think there was things missing. Um, obviously, people, you know, weren't included um, who I think should have been included. And so, you know, there's criticisms there, criticisms there, but you can understand them. You can see kind of the nuances, the complexities of what he was going through. And, you know, I think that's important. Uh, Ch- Champion Jack Dupree is another good one just because of his experiences as a youth and how he was raised, what, what, he, what he went through, and then he ended up spending most of his music career, the bulk of it, in Europe just because he appreciated the uh, how he's welcomed in Europe versus the United States. And it's kind of interesting just going through all of that and what his identity was and thinking about um, you know, in the in those times, you know, nineteen forties, I guess nineteen fifties, maybe at that point, I guess, because uh, it was post war, first post World War II. Um, so you know, he was, uh, you know, so er, still early in the in Europe. Um, you know, you have to expect that, you know, his experiences and identity, how that shifted, how that uh, impacted them going there, um, and know what what culture he brought with him you know how did he adapt um a lot of that and you know he's one of the people who are a little bit less known um here especially um and you know also in europe just because i think a lot of times when one of the issues with the blues in general and why it's not super well documented is we saw a lot of musicians go to europe because they appreciated the better treatment they uh were able to play uh you know bigger venues because they were integrated they weren't you know only relegated to black only venues uh we saw the first american blues festival in europe um even though uh, you know blues is the folk mer- music of america we saw you know a lot of things and one of the issues is that you know it was documented in europe but i think you know europe also you know is not you know they're not um obligated to document the history of musicians from America. And so in a lot of ways, America dismissed some of the stories and histories of these musicians and were welcomed and are, were documented very well in that context in Europe. But, you know, you're missing some of the history just because, you know, another country is prob- is not going to see itself as needing to be the documentarians. They would expect that the home and a uh, place where these musicians are from, because they see them as heroes, you know, they influenced you know, this huge uh, British inv- invasion, the music phenomenon known as the British invasion, and all these blues rock musicians who came over, like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all of those uh, guys, you know, they influenced that whole um, process. So, you know, in, th- in their life, these are heroes. These are people that, you know, must be, you know, seen very highly, you know, worshipped, you know, um, seen at the highest way in America, but, you know, not necessarily the case, you know, to some degree, yes, and to some degree, no. Um, so, yeah, th- just the whole, uh, that whole uh, concept and theme and for Jack- Champion Jack Dupree going over to Europe during those times, I think is interesting. And, of course, Laverne Baker is another one who I think is pretty well known in her time, maybe not historically um, overly well, um, <clears throat> but she's another interesting individual just because of you know, the way she came up, uh, it was essentially the rock and roll era. Um, you know, at this point, we saw other, a number of other black women um, uh, singers and vocalists at this time who had had a lot of success. She, actually, she Ruth Brown preceded her, who was, um, you know, a very big hit. And she kind of speaks on some of the racial complexities of rock and roll and R&B. Um, but Laverne Baker comes along and kind of uh it's interesting just because the way that she her career unfolds as far as just identity and where she's able to take it in comparison to some of the previous artists and you know she really ends up spending a lot of her time um in the philippines on a navy base in the end just because of you know at this point you know it's a little bit less about race and gender and once again, we're, you know, still very present, very uh, important. But now we're also seeing a very dominant impact from the industry and sort of the expectations and the lifestyle that um, these musicians 
are now living just because they are having crossover effects and you have another culture, you know, really um, paying attention to you for specific reasons and, you know, wanting a specific product. Um, but not you're not necessarily getting, you know, sort of the full experience and full acceptance. So you're, in addition to kind of these gender and racial um, issues, you're also getting, you know, the sort of this interesting um, exposure and access and new pressures and not necessarily barriers, but uh, sort of conditions um, just from the industry aspects. And, you know, I, I, and I think, uh, you know, Liver and Baker is interesting because of the way how she got into the industry as far as her earlier career and some of the ways that she had to portray herself, you know, in some ways not all super different from Mommy Smith, but definitely different when you consider the era and the, the, and the times. Um, but she, you know, would speak in the past about not liking her early career and what she, the character she kind of portrayed at that time or character, mostly one character. And then kind of how her career progressed and ended um, you know, unfortunate ending. Um, but, you know, another example of, um, you know, sort of kind of this identity and how things kind of shift um, over time um, and become a little bit more nuanced or seemingly more nuanced. I don't think things are necessarily more complex than they were then, but we, the way we're able to see them just because of the information that's available to us and um, where, where are we on that time? Um, yeah, I don't wanna take too much time just to try to briefly go over these examples. So I, I, I mean, so lastly, or one of the last concepts I really find very fascinating, fascinating and I mentioned this in an earlier assignment is just the uh, rural black identity. Um, and I just, I briefly talk about with Jack L. Cooper but you know this idea and concept that these rural Black Americans were shaping the urban music of tomorrow. You know, you look at Charlie Patton, um, probably one of the best examples. You know, this early rural blues. Um, you know, it had all the rhythms. It had you know the lyrics, the styles, um, you know, the showmanship. It had all of the components that went into. Um, you know, these later genres, you know, the urban blues, R&B, funk, you know, all of these early, uh, you know, all the concepts of polyphonic rhythms, um, you know, for Charlie Patton specifically, he had a lot of these specific aspects. But then, you know, you, you look at Robert Johnson, who's another country, you know, Delta blues guy, and you listen to his version of like Sweet Home Chicago. And, you know, it's even though it's an acoustic version, you know, you can see the way it flows, the rhythm, the progression, you know, it's really almost exactly the same as it is now. And if you listen, you know, to a modern version, you know, it's, uh, it's still blues, but it's very, uh, you know, it's a shuffle Chicago style. Um, but it's very, um, you know, it's very rock and roll esque and you're not really seeing a huge difference. And obviously as we see in the timeline, things evolve, you know, at that time, there's no electric bass. So where are you going to get the bass rhythm from? You know, um, it was up to the, the acoustic guitar player to play bass. And especially, you know, when we consider the recording technology, they're not going to necessarily pick up, you know, some of these, if they're playing a, a bass or something, a bass rhythm or something within their rhythm structure, or their music structure. Uh, I mean, that's not really a, a super important detail, but but, you know, regardless, you know, the, the bass, um, electric bass, when you get moved to electric guitars and electric bass, that changes everything. Now you can uh, you can increase the percussion section. You can have this drum set. You can have, you know, more dominant uh, percussion from that, that drum player. And, of course, bass, um, the bass sound in general, you know, before there's electric bass, you don't really, you know, there's not a dominant bass sound. You just, you mostly just have these uh, lead instruments, um, you know, you have stand-up bass, which is just kind of, you know, holding the the, the bass, the rhythm, and the uh, bass line, just kind of keeping, being the backbone of the, of the entire musical structure, and you don't really have an opportunity to really bring that to the forefront. The bass is almost for the musicians more than anything, 
um, to hold it together. Just sort of when you think about early percussion, you know, the early bass, early percussion, you're, you know, the, the bass, um, the bass line is almost just the backbone is holding everything together, keeping everyone on time, on point. And until you have the ability to amplify that and bring it to the forefront, you know, it's not, it's not a factor, but when you listen to some of these old, older, you know, rural blues musicians, they were already, you know, the pieces were all there. It was just a matter of the technological innovations and advancements to really allow a lot of these musicians to move and adapt and create these sounds. And, you know, I think it's a very interesting concept. Um, another great example is Tommy McLennan. Uh, Tommy McLennan, you know, grew up in rural Mississippi playing rural blues, but, you know, he's not very well known. But when you look at his, his catalog and some of the limited performances that he has, uh, you know, his, his uh, blues is very modern, almost like electric urban blues, you know, very little bit, little changes. So, you know, these, these uh, rural black Americans were shaping kind of these urban sounds. And I think it's interesting just because, uh, you know, today we think of the black community is so heavily tied to, you know, the urban environment and just the, the urban community. So, you know, I think, you know, obviously there's still a very large um, black um, presence, black American presence in the South. And, you know, I think overall when people go back um, to those times, if you do want to go back in the timeline, you know, you heavily associate uh, the rural life with slavery, of course. Um, but, I, you know, I think just taking that sort of concept, you know, isolating that whole concept of, you know, what was happening um, culturally and musically in in the rural South, um, in Mississippi and uh, Texas and all of these areas, Louisiana. You know, I think it's very interesting that, uh, you know, we think of these sounds as being very corely urban. Um, I think especially when you think about modern music and how modern music was really shaped in New York, you know, Harlem and, um, and those areas, uh, which it was, but I think, you know, once again, you can still kind of go back to these, this rural sound and these rural musicians. And even though it doesn't sound like it, uh, you know, when you taste, listen to it face value, it sounds pretty, sounds like rural blues. Um, but when you really break down the songs, uh, it's very clear that, you know, all the elements, um, all the data, you know, all of the, uh, it was all there. And, you know, the stories, you know, the lyrical structure, you know, it was all, uh, it all kind of goes back to that. And, you know, we don't necessarily make that connection from that rural to the urban all the time. Um, and I feel like that's a definitely a disconnect. So something, something uh, you know, interesting to think about, you know, as you move forward. And I guess, I guess the final concept that I'll speak of is just, it's not a, a major one, I, th I don't think, because it's we kind of touch on it a little bit at the end of the timeline. But just as you see uh, black musicians finally get control over music and expression, you know, generally speaking, uh, you see more of more controversy within the black community. You know, you see a lot of more of that inner conflict, not that it wasn't there before, but um but just when you talk about specifically from an industry standpoint, uh, you know, Jockey Jack or Jack the Rap, also known as Jack the Rapper, was really big into this um, as far as, you know, from his vantage point. And, you know, for those of you uh, who know, know about his convention that he used to hold, um, it's uh, he just, you know, was seeing sort of from the perspective of black radio and some of these black uh, labels that were kind of coming up just that there was a separation as far as or also perpetuation as far as how uh, um, black labels and some of these black producers were treating black artists you know it was almost like you know it was it was just becoming um, the same as the mainstream um, or how the white um, own labels were treating black musicians. Uh, 
it was just being now done by the black labels and and just how things were kind of evening out um i think jockey jockey jack was a little bit or jack the rapper was a little bit more um harsh on allowing uh or integrating you know white professionals into black labels as well but i think more so though the theme was just kind of this now uh perpetuation that we saw and that's one of the criticisms of sylvia robinson who sylvia robinson is you know a really important person on the timeline as far as her musical career um if you listen to her she's uh very one of the early creators of the disco sound and then goes on to really you know uh when she starts uh sugar hill uh sugar hill records um you know she really has you know the powerhouses well all the well-known uh, powerhouses uh in early hip-hop um when you uh talk about um the sequence uh when you talk about uh, Grandmaster Flash, um, you know, a lot of these early, uh, of course, the Sugar Hill Gang, of course, you know, when you talk about Sugar Hill Gang and the sequence, you know, really the, the first, uh, when you think about commercial um, rap albums or hits, I should say. Um, but, you know, one of the knocks on her is like Sylvia Robinson got some of these artists into these, you know, long contracts. I think with the sequence, it was like a 30 year contract. And so they weren't, they didn't get paid. They got their hit was, you know, in the late seventies, almost 1980. And so they didn't get paid until like the, you know, the 2010s, you know, for their, they weren't really making money off their hits or, you know, royalties. So, and you know, that's of course a big thing. That was a big theme with black artists just getting, uh, screwed over all these years uh, out of money and now we kind of see potentially the same thing happening uh, but you know with black producers or black label owners uh, doing the same thing to black musicians once again um, so that's a, just a kind of a final theme um, I'm, I'm not we don't really get into the timeline because as you can see our timeline ends at 1984 um, so you know we don't really get super deep into an era where we see a lot more um, black owned labels and record companies and management uh, you know at this time we're just kind of uh, just getting into it you know with like Silver, Sylvia Robinson and and company and you know we see that theme a little bit with Motown Records Motown Records is a little bit different just because you know Motown Records is was really the the key with Motown Records is the, is the formula um, um, how they, how they sort of found this, uh, formula and were successful with it and just kind of continued with that. And it wasn't necessarily that they were, you know, there's a lot of, uh, bad business within the music industry, but the way Motown Records was kind of going about it was a little bit different just because they structured their entire, um, business in a way where they had a core band and they had these core features that you know that of course they were going to pay they were going to fund and then some of these other artists were a little bit more about image you know that a lot of songs were all written by you know, a lot of songs were written by Smokey robinson and some of these other core artists you know you have exceptions like stevie wonder and and other you know other artists but but you know so these other artists who are getting written for you know you have a little bit less of a demand or say you know if if the record company is doing so much of the heavy lifting for you so it's a little bit different you know i'm not saying it's it's uh right or wrong you know I, it's just a little bit of a different situation but anyways um i'll try to wrap this up i know i hope you you all check out this timeline um if any of these artists or stories caught your attention or themes you know you can even just um briefly you know scan through it uh, the bios are very brief um, but there's clips from the actual episodes that go a little bit more into detail about each artist and there's examples of the songs that are on the timeline in addition to maybe some other songs in some cases and like i said this the timeline ends at 1984 it's definitely not trying to say that that's when uh hip-hop was like fully evolved or whatever you know it's just it it ends with um, 
the song Unity by James Brown and African Bambada, who, interesting enough, are very controversial figures in music history and uh, American culture in general. But um, but it was just kind of symbolic, um, just because you know funk really is funk and hip hop are very interesting genres um, in Black American music history, just because funk is really kind of departure from the industry and the black community it, during that time was a very prideful time. It was a, a time of uh, social justice, um, you know, in that 1970s, 1980s era. And, you know, the black community really all of a sudden had their own, um, uh, you saw big artists to, um, uh, prioritizing the R&B charts, which was the charts of the black community and, you know, really kind of feeding off of that time and era. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. And then that funk, of course, you know, you look at hip hop culture and rap and all of that. And, you know, it's kind of the basis of, of that as well. So, you know, you, you go with funk, it kind of continues, you know, James Brown represents funk and African Bambada, uh, you know, rep- represents early hip hop um, in a lot of ways. Um, so that was just kind of ending. It's more of a, a beginning than an end because it's hard to say where, we, you know, I don't think it's too early to say where hip hop and rap, you know, whether you believe that hip hop is still uh, around or, if, you know, it's just kind of rap music now, whatever your beliefs are, um, you know, where those end. Um, and, you know, when we're, will another genre begin? You know, who are going to be the sort of the originators or the, the people who kind of construct or really define some of these different differences in uh, the hip hop and rap genres? You know, where are the new genres? You know, how do we separate from subgenres? Because, of course, in this timeline, we, we only talk about the core genres. There's a ton of subgenres that you can get into. Um, so, you know, you can basically go, get as deep as you want to but was just trying to really cover some of the, the core stuff and so I think it's too early to see what say where it goes and I think one of the interesting things about hip-hop and funk is you just have this huge international presence that you just didn't have as much of in the other genres as far as other artists really simultaneously getting involved in the development of these genres as they as the community or the artists the originators were developing and especially with hip-hop and, you know, you just look around the world now. We live in a much more global world. So, you know, what will, you know, f- future genres look like? Um, you know, will they be as black defined, you know, as we've been able to define these genres so far? You know, I think it's interesting. I think it's hard to, to say. You know, I think the the purpose of the timeline was just really to link the genres together. You know, really, once again, hammer down how and why uh, blues is really the core um, component of modern music. And so regardless of where we go from here, you know, as long as we recognize that, you know, I think we can continue to appreciate whatever, you know, evolves and comes from this. And, you know, the blue lineage is supposed to just be a discussion, you know, as we talked about oral tradition, you hope to get, you know, people uh, as, you know, the listener base uh, evolves and people uh, kind of um, reach out uh, hopefully people will have stories that, you know, from family members, people with lived experience, personal experience that maybe we haven't heard from, heard about, or, you know, just anecdotal stuff that, you know, just would contribute to like the, the over, overall texture and richness of, you know, what this uh, community and what the project is about, which is, you know, just kind of integrating stories and, you know, can thinking about and talking about what the future and what the current status of music and the industry and you know who is defining you know the the sounds and um some of the movements and you know different uh how do you say i mean technology is definitely an important component but just how it's kind of all coming together being integrated together and kind of paying homage to these early artists and the timeline and also moving it forward um so please, you know, check out the timeline. If you have any other questions, you know, you can reach out to myself. Um, I can connect you to, um, if you're interested in these topics um, or classes or courses, to connect you to uh, uh, Morgan State University um, and the 
the um, Department of Social Work and Public Health. And, um, you know, thanks for listening. I'll check it out next time. Like I said, at the, from this point on, um, it'll be more current event based, uh, just things that are happening, things that come up. There's also a lot of stuff that we touched on earlier on the timeline, just different uh, subject matter that we might go back on, uh, go back into a little bit more in depth. And, you know, there should be some more articles coming up. Like I said, eventually we want to have guests. Um, we want to have stories um maybe in a more private space that we can create so um people feel comfortable you know kind of sharing their personal experiences and um you know always feel to reach out um you know it's really this is a living document even though the timeline is kind of set in what it is um as far as how the project expands and goes from here you know it's really up to the listeners and you know i'm very thankful for everyone who's uh tuned in so far you know there really wasn't a whole lot of uh marketing or advertising it was just kind of natural and you know people from all over the place tuned in um and it was uh it's been a pretty cool experience so far so i look forward to next episode and all the discussions and things that occur from this point on uh take care and thanks for listening